I have always been super passionate about data, and I know that sounds really weird to say, um, but it's always uh, been something that I feel like if you're going to go and make a business case for anything that you should have some hard facts to back you up. And for me, that's data. When I started the program, I was a senior business analyst at Express Scripts. Uh, from then, I actually moved into Accenture. So uh, Facebook was my client. I actually worked as a data engineer there for about a year. Uh, after that, I actually got a role as a data science consultant. So I have successfully, I think what I was looking for in this program actually came true for me was really getting that title of a data scientist. It's not a challenge that you can't overcome. Every single month we get a new class and I go into a panic and, um, you know, it, yes, it's always a shock. It's always a, can I do this? And you're always going to be doubting yourself, but there's so many people around you that believe in you that it's going to be really difficult for you to actually fail. I didn't expect to make as many friends as I have made in this program. I thought it was just going to be like me kind of on my lonesome on the side, like <laughs> trying to figure out how to answer all my homework questions by myself. But um, somehow like there's just so much camaraderie. Um, it's kind of amazing. I would say hit the submit button because you are not going to get better professors, a better community than what we have here. We threw around a bunch of ideas. The one that got us the most excited was this idea of trying to, you know, drag the healthcare industry kicking and screaming away from this strong preference for very simple predictive models into, you know, the future of machine learning. You can oversimplify machine learning models into two classes. You've got simple and you've got complex. Uh, simple models tend to be very easy to understand. So, you know, I can say, okay, so this patient's length of stay was 0.4 days longer because their blood pressure was 20 points higher. The problem there is that the real world isn't simple. And so we have models that are much more complicated, but can capture these very intricate uh, relationships between individual features and the outcome, but even how the features interact together. No matter how good a model is, it is not as good as a model that will be used. Can we develop complex models that beat uh, the current simple models being used by a lot of healthcare systems. And so that's what Henry, Tyvin, Michelle have all been working on quite a bit is building black box models that outperform existing ones in use. And then I've been working on these modules in Python for explainability so that we can say we can improve performance and potentially even improve explainability no matter what model type is used. Welcome to the University of Michigan School of Information Master of Applied Data Science Faculty Q&A. My name is Amy Humkus Hayes and I'm the Associate Director of Online Programs and the Strategic Advisor to the Leadership Team on Online Programs and Digital Content here in the School of Information. We are very excited to spend the next hour with all of you answering your questions about the MADS program and hearing directly from our founding director and MADS faculty, Zhao Ju Mi, and one of our esteemed faculty colleagues, Dr. Chuck Severins, as they talk about their experiences in the MADS program and answer any and all questions that you have about what it's like to be a MADS student. 
For a little bit of housekeeping, I'll start by saying if you have a question, and any question is a valid question in our view, please go ahead and type those into the chat. In an instance where you're asking a question that makes sense for our panelists, I'm going to go ahead and ask one or both of them to answer. In an instance where you have a really specific question, I welcome you to post it, but we may not be able to answer it here in the live Q&A, in which case we'll forward it to the right team and make sure you get a response via email. You are also always welcome to email UMSI dot mads at umich.edu with any individual questions that you have about, for example, your application or your application status. So at the beginning of our webinar, I would like to take an opportunity to get to know each of our faculty panelists a little bit better. Zhao Zhu, can you go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your experience in the MADS program? Absolutely. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. This is Zhao Zhu. Uh, hello from the big house. Um, as Amy said, that I'm very proud to be uh, serving the program as the first uh, director. Um, we spent the uh, fascinating three years building uh, this program from the scratch, and now we have a, a fully populated uh, curriculum. Um, so uh, I lead a faculty committee uh, that with uh, uh, more than 10 uh, excellent faculty members in uh, the School of Information uh, to talk about maths, uh, to discuss important issues uh, about uh, everything about maths and uh, help the deans to make decisions. Um, and uh, beyond that, uh, I also teach four courses in the math program. Uh, they include uh, data mining one and two, two courses, uh, and uh, the more technical and applied course called search engine uh, and recommended systems. And then uh, I am going to teach uh, the capstone projects that will be uh, the uh, final outlet of math students to help math students to build their um, portfolio project before you actually go uh, out of the program and step your uh, foot into the real market. Um, so uh, when I put the director of maths hat down, uh, I also lead a research group in the School of Information to do research related to large scale machine learning, data mining, uh, information retrieval, and a little bit uh, language, natural language processing. So we, we work on big data, of course. Uh, we discover, uh, you know, uh, patterns, uh, similarities, uh, you know, insights, uh, uh, and we make uh, scientific discoveries from this data. We even have a secret project looking at emojis. So if you're interested, I'm happy to talk more about what we do. Thank you so much. Many of you likely know our next panelist, Dr. Chuck Severance. Dr. Chuck is world known for his Python MOOCs on several MOOC providers, including Coursera, which also hosts our Master of Applied Data Science degree. We are enthused to have lots of folks joining us from around the world today. And Dr. Chuck is a great example of how we are spreading the UMSI ethos around the world. So Chuck, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you? Uh, sure. My name is Charles Severance. I've been on the faculty here since 2007. Uh, prior to that, I was a software developer and uh, ran uh, open source projects, uh, the Sakai project, which is an open source learning management system. Um, my research since 1997 has been in educational technology, and so it's not surprising that I have taken every chance that I possibly could to get involved in the most advanced application of educational technology to teach. Um, I'm a trained computer scientist, but I probably would be quickly ejected from any real computer science department because I don't really believe that technology is for some elite um, uh, walled garden of expert monks of computer science. And, Computer science is a rather, to me, exclusionary type of field. And so that's what's led me to the School of Information where I'm so happy to be here in that we're trying to take a broader, more liberal arts, more cross-disciplinary approach to technology. And I feel like I fit perfectly here in Python for everybody. If, if you've taken it, is it came out of that notion that we weren't here just for technology, but to, to find ways to make technology serve and that's where a data science career is so exciting because data science isn't just technology, even though technology is a big part of it. Data science is about informing, communicating, and all those things. And, and, and yeah, you pretty much ought to know a little bit of SQL to do that and maybe a little bit of visualization. And so in the MADS program, I teach uh, two courses. 
uh, SI 511 um, and SI 611. They're both, uh, they're sort of an intermediate and advanced SQL class. And you may see some of that material on Coursera as a Postgres for everybody specialization. Um, 511 and 611 for me are great. Uh, Kwaju teaches like, you know, intermediate and advanced machine learning. And that's really difficult, at least for me. I'm just amazed at all the other things that my colleagues and Mads teach. Um, 511 and 611, I'm just trying to give you skills, right? Because part of SQL and databases, it's hard to be an expert because you're always learning, but the basics are something we can teach. And so I was able to, in two courses, cover what I thought was the solid starting point for a long, long time uh, educational activity, uh, learning and using SQL in your job. And so I'm really proud to be part of this. Um, I, I, like I said, anything that has to do with advancing the cause of education through using educational technology is something that appeals to me and what we've done here with MADS. And I can't take much credit at all. I mean, Kwaju and Amy have worked so hard and uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that they do all the hard work and I get to come and teach a few classes and talk to you. Thank you so much. So as I indicated before, this is your opportunity to spend about an hour together with UMSI MADS faculty and our esteemed program director. And so any question that you have about the program is certainly something that we are happy to talk about today. If you have questions again that are specific to admissions but general about the admissions process, it's likely that we can also answer those too. And as I indicated before, if you're in the application cycle and you have really specific questions about your application, please do email us at umsi.mads study.du. So to go ahead and start, um, Judge Yu, we talk about this program as being a technical program for non-technical and technical people. So in other words, we don't require a very specific background in order to gain admissions into the MADS program. And yet at the same time, many of our applicants often indicate to us or even our students in the trajectory of the program that before they apply to or before they started the MADS program, there was some fear about, do I know enough? Am I situated well enough within the data science and information science domains? Um, is this um, the right program for me by virtue of having a less technical background, for example? Can you talk a little bit about how the program is designed for folks from a vast variety of backgrounds and what we do to address some of those concerns? Oh, absolutely. Uh, thanks for asking that question. So as Chuck said uh, really greatly that uh, our vision is not to actually provide education to some elites, uh, to, you know, the, the, the technical folks who have already got like programming skills since 12, right? Uh, our goal is really to, you know, provide the chance to turn the um, domain experts into data scientists. Because uh, we see the mission of uh, using data-driven approaches to make decisions in almost every aspect of the new society, of the future society, right? And with that mission, uh, we really wanted to, uh, you know, provide this curriculum for anyone, everyone who's really interested in, you know, learning uh, data science and making use of the data that's generated in their everyday context, in their, uh, you know, everyday work uh, to make better decisions. And then to really use what they have uh, discovered from the data to change everyone's lives, of course, towards the good way. So towards that, we build a curriculum that starts with, uh, you know, that hardcore machine learning, hardcore, uh, you know, data mining stuff like Chuck said, we instead start with telling people how to become a data scientist, right? Uh, what uh, it takes to be a data scientist. And then we go through everything uh, through the beginning, like, you know, how to harvest data from the context, how to manipulate the data, right? How to actually use visualizations to draw uh, insights from the data. And they, of course, require some programming skills and statistical skills, but these can actually be picked up by uh, either having some uh, prior experience or just taking uh, Dr. Chuck's uh, Python for Everybody or Python 3. Uh, that's another book visualization that School of Information provides on uh, Coursera. Right. And also uh, some basic uh, statistics concepts that you can also, uh, you know, gain from taking uh, book specialization or having a uh, basic uh, undergrad training uh, from one course or two. Right. And uh, after that, you can actually take, uh, you know, our technical courses one at a time, uh, step by step, start with, uh, you know, um, data manipulation and then uh, visual exploration of data. And then you can come to uh, databases 
uh, and then you can actually do some data mining, right? Uh, we start with uh, simpler approaches, uh, smaller scale approaches, so that uh, you know you can actually um, deal with small scale data, right? Write programs uh, in uh, Python notebook, uh, but uh, in these courses we provide you uh, with half cooked programs that you're not going to like develop uh, thousands of lines of program at the beginning, right? All you need to do is to understand the course content and, you know, complete programs that can actually, you know, transform A from B. And then after that scale, right, you will actually experience the so-called milestone project uh, that tests your understandings about how to deal with, uh, you know, data sets, how to actually manipulate the data and then generate, uh, you know, good insights by visualization. Right. Then after milestone two, after milestone one, you will actually encounter a set of more advanced courses. And these courses will help you build up your skills, not only uh, programming uh, perspective, but also ethically. Right. And in those courses, you will deal with harder, uh, you know, machine learning concepts, uh, statistical concepts, and then you will write longer programs. Right. So in this case, instead of finishing a few lines of code to implement functions, you will be able to write, uh, you know, full functions that actually uh, transforms one kind of input from output. Uh, right. Build machinery model that can take into uh, uh, the raw data and provide uh, predictions. And then after that set of courses, you will actually do the milestone two project. That is the larger skill uh, project that you will actually practice the analytics uh, skills like machine learning, data mining, right, deep learning, uh, these things that you have learned, right. Then after milestone two, uh, for students who are interested, they can actually take more advanced uh, technical courses. For instance, uh, building a search engine, building a recommender system. Right. So the course that I'm teaching right now, students no longer just finish a few functions. Right. Sometimes they have to write, you know, uh, long uh, functionalities of a search engine from the scratch. Right. And then uh, in courses like uh, advanced natural language processing, right, you will be able to apply machine learning techniques to actually build a natural language processing, uh, you know, technique that you know is more towards AI. Right. And then you will also uh, learn how to attribute, uh, you know, causal inference models that will help you uh, go deeper into statistics, go deeper into uh, econometrics, right? So you can actually gradually build up your understanding, your concepts uh, in data science, in statistics, in programming, right? And finally, you have this capstone project that you can apply everything that you have learned uh, from end to end in this program to really build something, uh, build a project that you can actually show off in your portfolio, right? And after that, we're glad to clear uh, to you know uh, claim that you are now a data scientist. So you can see that through this process, uh, you enter the program with you know um, some experience in programming, right? You have to pass the entrance exams, of course. Right, but not a lot, right? Uh, but with lots of motivation, with lots of passion about data science. Then after the program, you have become a data scientist that can apply uh, all these fancy techniques in your daily uh, activities. Isn't that cool? So the thing that I would add to that, uh, because you, especially when I'm, I'm, as I teach like 511, which is one of the earlier classes that people take. And so I tend to talk to a lot of students in my office hours and, and they don't always have a lot of questions for me. And so I just ask them questions. I'm like, how are, how are you doing, right? How, how are you doing? What was your background? And the, and the strong sense I get from talking to students in you know, one of the first classes that they take, not the first class, but one of the first classes is that, um, the flexibility of how many classes you take at any given time is a critical element to dealing with people with different backgrounds. And the key mm -hmm. thing is, is that you need to not try to believe that if you don't know anything about programming, that you can do this in, in a compressed seven month time. It just isn't gonna happen. But, and, and you don't wanna take too long because part of going to grad school is you can compre we compress your learning so that what you learn at the beginning you haven't forgotten by the end and so it all it all starts to build if you if you go too slowly then it doesn't build very well and you're always you're like four years later you're going back and took taking that intro class and so you can't spread it out but I think that what we see and and Amy and Kwaju can talk about this perhaps from a data perspective 
is those first few, first one or two classes, you, you kind of use those to balance what you know, fill in your gaps, don't try to take too many classes, and then speed up later. And I think that's how we make it. So some people know a lot, they hit the ground running, they take three classes at the same time, bang, 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 bang. Some people are like, I want to take one class, I want to kind of work on a Python and get my statistics a little stronger and, and fill in my gaps, but then they can speed up later. And so I think that's one of the nice things, especially at the beginning where you can sort of modulate your workload a little bit. Thank you, Chaju and Chuck. Both of you did a really tremendous job of talking both about the content of the degree and how we operationalize and what it means to teach end-to-end -end data science for, again, folks from a variety of different backgrounds, but also the structure of the degree. So as UMSI's first 100% online degree, we are also using a fairly novel approach of mostly one month, one credit long courses. And so to Chuck's great point, it enables our students to take as few as one credit and as many as three credits a month in order to account for, for example, their comfortability or previous skill within a specific um, course. So speaking of the structure of the degree, Chuck, we have folks that are really interested in understanding how faculty engagement works in math. So in other words, what's, what's asynchronous, what's synchronous, um, are sessions pre-recorded or not? You know, when do you have an opportunity to see faculty live? Can you talk a little bit about that in the context of how you set up your courses? Yeah, um, so, so there is, a, first off, a wide range of courses. Some courses, like my courses, are what I'll call a skill course, meaning that, you know, I want you to know SQL when we're done. And, you know, if, if you take a path where you don't need a lot of help on the way to SQL, then I'm happy with that. Um, other courses, like the Capstone, are, are going to have more regular interaction because it's designed into the class to have more regular interaction. So I'll start by talking about um, just teaching a class like uh, 511, uh, you know, introductory SQL. I have office hours, two hours a week. That's my primary interaction with students. They're just wide open, just like you could walk into my door and you just, we start talking. Um, this week, we got into a long conversation about auto increment fields as implemented in Oracle Postgres and MySQL and how they changed the philosophical database architecture within it. And so the, the, I don't know how that started. The student just was asking me questions. And then I'm like, well, you know, that whole auto increment thing, there's kind of a neat story there. And so off and on, off we go, right? And so there's conversations that happen. The other interaction is Slack. I, I am terrible at Slack, which means I go start it like once a day. Um, and I say, you have to email me to say, go, go get on Slack. And then I, I will go get on Slack and people email me. Um, and um, the, the core material for, for my courses and for, for most courses is pre-recorded, right? The, you're not sitting in a synchronous lecture waiting for something. Um, and I don't know if you've done face-to-face -face education and online education. And I'm curious if Kiwaju feels the same way. I can tell you a concept that I wanna tell you online in a recording in about six minutes. To say the exact same thing live synchronous takes about 25 minutes, literally, partly because I start telling a story about my race car or I see someone in the upper corner that's kind of got a quizzical look on their face. And I think, mm, I, missed, I missed that person, so I better go back and repeat everything again. So a six minute piece of knowledge in a live classroom becomes 25 minutes. Now, you might watch my six minute video and it might become 25 minutes because you have that look on your face and all you do is you go back, right? But not everyone has to go back. Whereas if we're doing it live synchronous, then I'm trying to, to get it right. And so, so we, I try to keep my, the online lectures not, it's not like a two hour droning on and on and on. I somewhere between five and 18 minutes with 12 minutes as the average. I also expect that most students, I think the best way to absorb that material is to concentrate on it and then sometimes make it go 1.5 or 1.25 fast rather than just listening and doing something else like watching Netflix on one screen and just listening to me on another screen. You're probably better off just speeding me up and listening and focusing. 
Um, and then for me, I, I really try to value your time. I try to teach you as fast and efficiently as I can. And I try to give you assignments that hit the learning objectives that I have without sort of giving you like 20 hours of just doing it over and over again. I just, the, the notion that somehow you just have to just, just stay up all night or anything like that. If, if I'm trying to teach you this much and I can make an assignment that's that big, that's what I do. I, and and it, the most common complaint I get in my class are people who sort of already know SQL and they're sort of like, man, I want more challenging and rigorous and fierce assignments to challenge me. And I'm like, yeah, maybe. But 90% of the people don't know SQL and they just want to learn it versus, you know, you know SQL and you want to show off your hacker rank skills. And so the bigger complaint I get is that I didn't make the classes hard enough. But if you then finish them and you look back, you're like, whoa, I learned a whole lot and it wasn't too painful. And that's that's what, to me, I try to engineer the class to maximize what you learn. Um, the other thing I didn't mention is we will almost always have at least two people on the teaching staff and uh, sort of the instructor of record and a teaching assistant. And the teaching assistant and between us where we talk and we do office hours, we each have office hours, we're all on Slack. And so we try to be as responsive as possible and we're available on email. And so my course is one of the gain some skills and move on. But other courses are, are the kind of courses where you get to know the professor because they're doing something that's more in their research area. And the next thing you know, you take a class from Chris Brooks and the next thing you know, the class is done. And then the next thing you know, you're working with Chris Brooks on research and now you're working, you know, and, and that kind of thing happens, right? So there are classes that sort of tend to sort of like blend into the, the more, uh, the, the higher level of interaction that is collaborative research. If you want to research with me, you'd have to learn to write Java and PHP and Angular and React and stuff like that and help me write software. But that's not what this program is about. Whereas someone like Chris Brooks, who's doing, you know, data science in his research, and you're taking a data science class, then he can sort of just sneak you across the boundary into the research. And so, so the interaction a lot depends on what you want to do. If you're in a hurry and you want to get through, you don't need a lot of interaction. If you want to spend some time and get to know people, you got office hours every week. Um, and so it's really what you make of it, I would say. Um, there's plenty of interaction available um, and it's, it's what you make of it. And that's really well said, Chuck. I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, um, I have been teaching quite a few courses uh, and uh, I, I can actually sense uh, the develop of, uh, uh, of different norms and different habits of using the different uh, communication channels. As Chuck said that we have uh, live office hours uh, that is completely synchronized. Uh, we have uh, pre-recorded videos uh, and that's completely asynchronous. And the Slack channel is sort of in between, it's like a semi-synchronous, right? Uh, for the pre-recorded videos, you can just watch that uh, everywhere. You watch that, you, you could watch that, uh, you know, uh, in, in Subway, <laughs> right? Uh, you could watch that, uh, you know, um, you, you could spend two hours just watching the videos one by one, right? Or you could actually do that when, when you actually uh, wake up, <laughs> right? Uh, in the midnight, I don't recommend that, right? Uh, for Snap channels, right? You ask questions and sometimes they get quickly answered by uh, the instructors or your fellow students. Right, and sometimes it takes a few hours. Right, uh, it takes some moments for people to think about it and then respond to you. Right, I can feel that uh, you know this provides a good flexibility for the students to find the combination, to find the mixture uh, of channels that suit them the best. Right, uh, I can see that some students always appear in office hours because face-to-face -face communications uh, are the most effective for their learning uh, outcome, and some students never show up <laughs> in office hours, but they're actually very active in the Slack channels, asking questions, answering questions, so and so forth, right? And when I teach the very uh, first course, Data Mining 1, uh, which is one of the first analytics course that we teach, right? I see more students appearing in office hours asking for clarifications of course content of you know, certain algorithms, certain concepts that you have in the pre-recorded videos, 
right? Uh, and I'm sure that in some of the office hours, uh, especially uh, for some of my co-instructors, students jump in and ask questions about coding, right? About, you know, how, how come that I couldn't actually make this uh, piece of code work, right? Uh, what did I miss here? But when I'm teaching this course, the search and recommend system, that's one of the uh, very last technical courses. I feel that students tend to attend the office hours for different reasons. They no longer ask for clarifications of course content and instead they bring in uh, a completely new data science problem to you, right? They say that, hey, I'm trying to build a search engine for my company, right? And the, the, the context looks like this. It's sort of related to what you talked about in the class, but here are some special constraints. Here are some special use cases that we need to consider, right? And we sit down and spend uh, you know, half an hour trying to formulate the problem, trying to find a solution for that complete problem. So I feel a lot of joy, right, during this process. And you can actually see that how students are leveraging different communication channels and how they are developing, right, from, um, you know, focusing on the homework assignments to actually applying what they have learned to change the world. Thank you both again for giving us such great information and insight into how MAD students interact with MAD instructional teams and the way in which we couple great flexibility with a high level of support. So Jiaoju, just to build on what you were saying and in the spirit of what I said earlier about as few as one credits and as many as three credits a month, um, we talk a lot about flexibility in this degree and how people can pace it according to other things that are going on for them in life. Um, what would you, add to to that when we talk about this idea that we have a really flexible degree program for a wide range of learners for example different parts of their career or even living throughout the different parts of the globe well that's a really good question uh so um when we started to build the mass program we're thinking about what objectives we have for this uh, for our curriculum and the two things that we value a lot are uh, rigor right and personalization and of course you cannot provide full personalization so flexibility is actually one big step uh, you know in between so um, we design the curriculum in a way that you know if you uh, have uh, a different background and you have uh, you know your own uh, ha learning habit uh, your own uh, 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 schedule uh, limits, schedule constraints, you can actually take one year, two years, three years, um, maybe uh, 18 months to finish the program, right? So uh, what's funny is that, um, you know, we just graduated our first cohort of students, right? And we had this uh, grant uh, graduation ceremony. Uh, and then we had two representatives from our uh, students to give uh, the presentation in that ceremony. And that's just so different. Right. One of them um, didn't know, uh, you know, anything about programming before they take Chuck's Python for everybody. <laughs> right. So they came into the program. Um, the uh, just after they finished, uh, you know, basic training in Python. Right. And then they took two years to actually learn everything and finally become, uh, uh, you know, uh, a data scientist and completely changed their uh, career path. Right, another student, right? Uh, by the way, uh, the other student was not in the first cohort of math students, right? But he just spent one year finishing the whole program and then graduated uh, as the first cohort, right? And then uh, now he's actually the, the, chief data, uh, the chief data scientist, whatever the title is of the, uh, his own company, <laughs> right? So you can actually see the difference uh, of those uh, very, very different uh, career passes, very, very different background of people, right? Uh, my point is that if you're passionate about data science, right? And if, you're, if you trust uh, the world-class uh, faculty uh, in the University of Michigan, you can always find a path that works the best for you, right? And we can guarantee that every path has the sufficient rigor to prepare you from, um, you know, knowing uh, from zero to 100. <laughs> right, uh, of data science and become a real data scientist. Thank you for, for mentioning those fantastic stories. We were really impressed and deeply humbled when we heard from students 
remarking about their time in the maths degree. And as you indicated, one who went very quickly and already had interest in and experience in the field, and one who moved a little bit slower and had no previous experience in the field. And yet both who've come out with great relationships, lifelong friendships, as a result of being in the maths degree, um, University of Michigan alumni engagement, right? So they're both University of Michigan alumni. And so they get to carry that as in the 600,000 plus living alumni around the world. And they're both practicing data scientists. Um, and so it really was just a wonderful opportunity to hear those success stories. Now I have a question that I think is relevant for both of you. So Chuck, I'm gonna start with you. Um, as you can imagine, folks are really interested in how we're introducing tools, techniques. Um, for example, people have, managed, uh, have mentioned things like the command line, Git, cloud computing. Can you talk a little bit about how we're exposing folks to different tools within the degree program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, one of the things that is really kind of uh, <clears throat> the underlying principle of the technology we use is to try to keep you as close to what you're going to be using when you get out in the real world. And um, we don't, for example, have a course on Linux commands, but we sure don't shy away from using Linux and showing you Linux. Of course, Sarah has this nice little thing where you click a button and it starts up a little Linux environment, also a Jupyter, a Jupyter notebook in a Linux environment. So those teachers who want to kind of teach you to run programs and small programs in Linux, we just use that. And or if we want to do it in Jupyter Notebooks, Jupyter Notebooks is probably the one unifying theme across what we do, but we don't stop there. Um, and so we do teach a lot of, you know, Linux commands, not so much as here's, here's your Linux tutorial, but we use Linux. So part of that is that um, in the real world, Linux has become the cloud server operating system of choice. I mean, it, you used to think maybe Windows NT Server or Solaris or, 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 or and the answer is that those are, those seem, uh, it's quasi was smiling because it's like, no, those are so silly now. But, you know, 10 years ago, we might have thought that some of those, so we want you to know Linux because you really, you know, part, part of our goal is not so much that you are going to be the person who runs the production infrastructure for your company. But we also want you to be able to look over the shoulder of the person that runs your production infrastructure for the company. When they start typing some weird commands in a weird command line, you're like, ah, yeah, you're typing uptime. I typed that back in grad school. I kind of know what that is. And so we really try to expose you to as much real stuff as we can. And once you get into the the, the, the milestone projects. And then especially in the second half, the, the, the example of quasi you use, where it's like, you're starting to come in and you're picking the tech, you're just like, you know, I'm go you're gonna pick the technology and you're gonna use technology that you're already using in your job. And so um, I would say that we, we give you a nice basis in basic technologies, Jupyter Notebook, Linux command line, those kinds of things, but then really a lot of it depends on where you want to go. And Joju, what would you add about um, some of the conversations, for example, that you and I have had, and you and the pro online programs committee certainly have had about the ways in which the data science field is changing and our students need to be prepared for those changes, particularly when it comes to the kinds of tools or proprietary um, software that they might be using or hardware. Right. Um, so uh, first of all, Chuck uh, raised a really good point that we wanted to prepare you for the real thing, for uh, for the uh, you know real uh, for the real job that you're going to do after uh, you step out from the program, and that actually backs up lots of our uh, discussions and uh, decisions of the uh, faculty uh, committee. We had lots of discussions about you know uh, what means to uh, the future data scientist, right? Uh, so we started with the approach that we know that uh, eventually we'll be dealing with large scale data set. Eventually we, you'll be applying all kinds of machine learning tools. Eventually you will know how to actually call uh, from different libraries, right? Uh, call APIs and also, uh, you know, build your own tools. Right, so that's why that you know we're keeping uh, evolving our curriculum to add uh, courses like cloud computing uh, for data science, 
right? Uh, where, you know, putting lots of uh, thoughts into milestone projects, capstone projects, trying to, you know, we provide the training in uh, everything that Chuck has said, right? Unix command lines, uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, yeah. But we encourage you to go beyond that, right? We encourage you to go out of the comfort room, but not in every class, in, in the, you know, capstone projects class. Right. And that's where that we want you to try something in the wild, right? To find a deficit that is so big, right? That you would not normally touch in uh, the one month course, right? And then to find some, you know, nice machine learning algorithms that are the state of art that's probably just proposed uh, last year or even last month, right? And then, you know, do something with uh, Amazon's web service, right? Or uh, Google Cloud Service, right? Uh, use GPUs, right? Uh, make those deep learning uh, methods work, right? And we encourage to go outside and then, you know, find the sets that are, uh, you know, resist in uh, your own company or uh, a data set that is so valuable to you that no one has actually touched, right? Bring them in into the Capstone projects because we understand this is what you will do for your life as a data scientist later, right? So there are just, tremendous discussions we're having in the committee uh, about that. And you know what, uh, we're actually evolving very quickly. So uh, the whole team have the innovative mind, right? Whenever we see something that is important, whenever we see some you know, high demands from students, uh, well, we'll try our best to bring that into our curriculum, right? Excellent. Um, you mentioned the the big data so in other words how we support students that are bringing to us big data sets um, and we did get a specific question about whether or not we teach a course for example on big data so can you talk a little bit more about how we again not only by the kinds of tools or the kinds of infrastructures or or methods or techniques that we're giving to students but also the kinds of um, ways in which we're staying really abreast of what's becoming popular in data science um, by virtue of its effectiveness. So for instance, you've talked a little bit about deep learning, um, big data came up. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those really exciting kind of cutting edge topics in data science that we're starting to delve into as a program? Well, absolutely. Uh, well, uh, I'd say that uh, let's, let's separate that uh, within like the, the scale of the data right, and then the fancy machine learning techniques, right. So to deal with big data, uh, we don't have one course, we have three courses. <laughs> we have, uh, right, we have efficient data processing, we have effective data processing. The first one is how to actually write your programs in a good way that, so if you have a single computer, right, how can you actually write, uh, you know, the data science programs efficiently, right. Um, and the second one is once you have many computers, for instance, how can you scale up the process, right. And then we have this new, uh, you know, cloud computing for data science. And that teaches you how to actually leverage uh, the, uh, you know, enterprise cloud like AWS or Google Cloud, right, or Azure, right, to actually use uh, these resources that you probably won't actually have access uh, to as the individual or as a small company, right? How to make use of these cloud computing uh, resources to build something big. But that's just about scaling up the data process, right? This is not uh, another completely, uh, you know, different aspect of the state of our machine learning, right? And again, we don't have one machine learning course. We have five. <laughs> we have supervised machine learning. We have unsupervised machine learning. We have deep learning. Uh, and we have machine learning pipelines that really tells you how to actually build uh, the professional machine learning end-to-end uh, -end pipeline that takes the data in and then pipe that through every component and then generate uh, you know, the desirable output. And then we have the deep learning course, right? Uh, the deep learning course, uh, of course, teaches you state of art of deep learning models, neural networks, right? Uh, and the deep learning course, uh, you know, uh, touches every aspect uh, about, uh, you know, convolutional uh, neural networks, uh, you know, recurrent neural networks, uh, graph neural networks, so on and so forth. And then we have this reinforcement learning course that's just recently added to the curriculum, right? And 
you know what, this uh, course was designed based on the huge desire by our current math students. They raised that, oh, this is one of the courses that we really wanted to have in the program. And then we say, fine, okay, let's find the right person to develop that course, right? Let's find the world expert that can actually deliver a good uh, reinforcement learning course. And in fact, this course is so well uh, registered that we're now looking for an additional uh, you know, instructor uh, to facilitate the first iteration. Right. And we're still talking about adding uh, another, the sixth machine learning course, right? It just happened in today's uh, faculty committee meeting. So you can see that we're really trying to bring all these aspects, not just on the size of the data, on the scalability of the data, but also right, uh, on the algorithms, on the state-of-art uh, machine learning AI techniques that you use to draw insights from the data. Reinforcement learning is such a great example, Jiaozhu, of hearing student feedback and acting on it. And because we offer one credit, one month courses, some in some ways it's actually easier for us to pivot into an area of data science and you know to some extent spin up a course. And it's not to say that that course is any less rigorous or that the production of that course um, isn't any less intense, for example. In fact, some of our faculty indicate it's actually more intense, but it is to say that in our model, we can add courses like that fairly quickly, particularly as we know that the, data, the field of data science will continue to evolve. Absolutely. Exactly. And if you think about our curriculum, our curriculum actually borrows insights from deep learning, right? So we design uh, our curriculum in a way that, you know, it's like a neural network. It's highly modularized. And, you know, uh, the feedback can pop back propagate from downstream courses to upstream courses, right? And then that will actually provide us with the flexibility to actually update upstream courses and bring in new components, uh, new components to the curriculum. Absolutely. Um, so Chuck, Jiaoju just mentioned a bunch of different courses, right? All kinds of machine learning courses and deep, big deep data courses. We've talked a lot about the value of your courses. So as you can imagine, we've got folks that are wondering, like, how does, like, what kind of support do I get kind of navigating and mapping out like plans for the for the program. You've worked in the School of Information as a clinical faculty for quite a number of years. Can you talk a little bit about how we are like what our approaches to working with students and particularly how we support students kind of making sense of things like course selection and mapping out a plan and and how we take faculty feedback too and, and act on that when we're helping students make those choices. Well, Amy, this the simple answer to your question is no. Right? But why is that no? Because you said, what do I know about how we help students? <laughs> now you understand where I'm going here, right? I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have been with this program since 2007, and I have been continuously amazed at the, the talent level of our staff, right? At the talent level of our advising, our staff that works about work, you know, your work life balance, uh, when you have issues. I have never been in a place in my whole life, and I've been part of a number of different organizations and departments where the staff is A, so amazing, and B, so well respected. Um, it is very common in higher education for uh, the, the fancy professors with their floppy hats to think that, that we are. The only thing that matters and the staff just scurry around to, uh, to take care of us and, and, and give us snacks at the right time or whatever. And the reality is, is to run an organization as complex as the School of Information, people like Kwaju and me, we wanna like the next iteration of some other thing. And, and literally it's so great to delegate so much of this to super talented staff. And, and the, the cool thing in the School of Information is when you're talking to a staff member during advising or if you've got some issue, um, when, when you're talking to that staff member, you pretty much are talking to the authority in the situation, right? You're not, you're not talking to someone who's just reading from a little card that says, is it plugged in? Right. I mean, and, and so what happens when the when the when the staff member says, you know what, we've had this conversation and I think you probably shouldn't take 511. I can't really make that decision right now, but I'm going to get a hold of Chuck and I'll just tell him I don't think that you should take 511. 
And now what she's really saying is, you're not going to have to take 511, but I got to go get a quick rubber stamp from Chuck. Because when we get a question asked of us to, to, to change a rule or to bend a rule or to do something different or accept someone who's a transfer student into a class, blah, 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 blah you know, give up on the prerequisites, we always say yes, right? And that's partly because our, our, our staff are so talented and they have a, such a good understanding and frankly, a better understanding of what the right thing to do is that we just lean on, lean on them uh, very heavily. And so, so Amy is part of the staff, right? And, um, but Amy is one of many. And uh, so I would say that you are, when it's all said and done, you will establish relationships with faculty on what you're learning and the arc of your research and the arc of your projects and a lot of that. But you, in terms of the arc of your progress from pre-admission all the way to graduation and beyond, you're gonna spend more, you're gonna have a much deeper relationship with the staff than you will with the faculty. And, um, and, and, and part of that is, is that this, this program to me is amazing that of the, 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 the courses themselves, cause you went through the five soon to be six machine learning classes. I barely knew the words he was talking about, right? And that's how a faculty works, right? I could sit here and talk for many minutes and I could say words that Kwaju would not understand about my area of expertise and it'd be okay. And so we see the world through our kind of exaggerated, um, you know, magnifying glass, right? We all focus on the world through our own magnifying glass and that, and we see that very zoomed in. And when you're in my class, you're kind of talking to a person who's completely zoomed in on databases, 30 to 40 years of database experience. And when you're talking to Kwaju, you're talking to a person who's similarly uh, zoomed in on that. And, and you bounce from each of these kind of little zoomed in areas over and over and over again. And you get to talk to someone who just thinks about nothing but databases all day long. And then you talk to somebody who thinks about nothing but machine learning all day long. And then when you talk to the staff, you are talking to somebody who thinks about your progress toward your degree and all of the things that you need to know. And I'll add just one more thing, and that is um, a tremendous source of information that will be of tremendous benefit to you are the other students. And that is true both for online and on campus. And so to some degree, you, we can kind of joke that, you know, we, the faculty, we create what we think is the learning experience. And then the real learning happens kind of in the lunchroom with all when all the students get together and then they synthesize and reinterpret what it is that we say and learn it together. And that happens more than you think in MADS as well. And that's where Slack is really, really valuable. And there's a whole bunch of Slack places. And uh, you know, I'll hear about somebody talking about this, that, or the other thing. And you'll dump into a really, really rich and deep interaction in Slack, which is pretty much all students talking about a job or a strategy for this or a strategy for that, sort of the, the same kind of lunchroom conversations that you have in a face-to-face, -face, those lunchroom conversations tend to happen in Slack. And Amy's finishing Amy's original question, how do, you, how do we help you get through the program? Well, Slack will be a big help to you because you'll be talking to people who are later on in the cohort and they say, oh no, take 611 right after 511. I know they tell you to take 511 and then wait a long time for 611, but you should take 611 right away, you know, whatever. And you'll, you'll hear that from another student. I'm not sure that's exactly the right advice. What I'm saying is that's an example of the kind of advice that you might get around the water cooler that is the mad slack. Yeah, I definitely wanted to add to that, Amy. Um, I 100% agree uh, with what Chuck has said. Um, so um, I wanted to use the energy from social networks, right? By the way, we have two social networks courses. We have a, a network analytics course and we have a social media analytics course in the program. Um, so if you look at some other programs or some other companies that if you look at staff and if you look at faculty, there are actually two different communities in the network structure, right? Uh, sometimes they barely talk to each other and, <laughs> right? But in bats, uh, you know, the staffs are amazing. They're not different communities, they're hubs 
right? They connect different parts of the social network, right? Um, people like Amy and people like our, you know, content specialist, Lawrence, they know everything. They know every aspect uh, of not just the curriculum, not just every instructor, right? They know every student. They know how to reach out probably two steps away to the provost office, right? They know, uh, you know, who to actually ask for if you have a computing problem, right? So they actually play a very important role in the network, right? Um, so all you need to do is to connect one of these hubs, and then you will actually have uh, all these great support and solutions. So this is absolutely amazing. Well, thank you so much. That was so well put and certainly echoes my sentiment about the fantastic team that we've built in MADS of faculty and staff who all really deeply care and are incredibly invested in centering the student experience and ensuring that all of our MADS students have a wonderful, rich, intellectually stimulating experience here and come out of the program as really ready data scientists and what we hope eventually are leaders in data science. So in just our last few minutes together, I was hoping that we could um, do two quick things. So one is if we could talk just um, very briefly about how we support teams. So in other words, where are we using teamwork in order to kind of prepare folks for working on data science teams? Um, so Zhaozhu, could you just say very briefly how we're doing that in our project-based courses? Absolutely. So we have three project courses uh, here. We have Milestone 1, Milestone 2, and Capstones. And they all feature a team project, right? And we got sufficient time for students to actually form teams based on their interest and based on, you know, whatever uh, constraints of their lives, because sometimes you actually get people from the same time zone, right? Um, and sometimes you get people from the same uh, sector, right? Um, and then uh, every team is going to uh, work on a project that's of your own uh, common interest. Uh, and we facilitate teams with lots of things, with everything we know about, you know, what a, a good, data science team would look like in the real world, right? Uh, and we also connect teams to teams. So, uh, you know, if you are doing a team project, you're not, not only, uh, you know, receive feedbacks from uh, people within your team, you also receive feedback from other teams, from the instructor, of course. So this is actually a question that students asked Dr. Andrew Yin, the keynote speaker of our uh, graduation ceremony, right? What he sees about uh, you know fascin uh, a fascinating data science team. His answer was like uh, you know uh, you, you you have to build a team with sufficient diversity, right? With competitory um, skill sets, and we are seeing lots of our teams uh, in our project based courses are like that. So you have a strong programmer, you have people who understand really deeply about uh, the domain, right? And you also have a good team manager, right? But they all contribute to the data science project. Absolutely. Well, we're coming to the end of our time together and there are a couple of questions that I fear we won't get to, but they're great questions. So in an instance where we don't get to your question, I welcome you to email us at umsi.mads at umich.edu. I will also add that we are going to host at least two additional faculty Q&As while stewarding our applicants through the winter 2022 admission cycle and beyond. So in an instance where you'd like to come join us for those, we will be promoting them very soon and you'll have an opportunity to come back and listen to other MADS faculty talk about their experiences. So in just 30 seconds, I was hoping that each of you could answer this question, why MADS? So if you were comparing MADS against other online degree programs in data science or other data science programs generally, Chuck, what would you say to somebody that's choosing between them? Why should they choose Mads. Well, I think that uh, one of the best things that we have at MADS is the one credit, uh, four week, one credit idea. Um, and uh, the word flexibility has been used a lot. And um, part of what you go to grad school to do is engage in a short, intense burst. But not everybody can come to Ann Arbor, quit their job, and somehow pay for their family for a year to do this short, intense burst or end up you know, so far in debt because they quit their job. What the one credit format, and I'm not, I'm not sure I predicted this in my own mind thinking about it when we started, the one credit format allows you to sort of shape the, the, the speed at which it happens so that you can, you don't want to slow down completely, but you can slow down a little bit. And so uh, when you need to slow down, you can slow down, but we don't want you to completely slow down to a crawl. And so I think that one credit uh, module and you, your student, you as a student's ability to sort of put your Lego blocks together uh, to get get through is uh, probably the the most amazing thing to me that uh, that is maths. Thank you.
And Zhao Zhu? My answer is, my answer is uh, shorter because it's Michigan, right? We, uh, the Michigan value drives us to build the best data science program in the world. Trust us, go blue. Well, I could not have said it better myself. So as I indicated before, in an instance where you'd like to join us for a future webinar, please know that we have a couple of fantastic faculty Q&As coming up soon. If you have additional questions, you're always welcome to email us at umsi.mads at umich.edu. And otherwise, as Zhao Zhu said, go blue.